Porch, how are we doing? Good to be here in Dallas and say hello to our friends in Houston and Fort Worth and other places that are tuning in. Man, it is awesome to be together. My name is Todd and uh, I get to hang out with you for a little bit tonight. We're talking about BC, man, before Christ. Stories that happen before the man that all of history pivoted on shows up. And I just want to start by just saying it's a little crazy sometimes when you read some of these stories. If you haven't been tuning in with us these last couple of weeks, you heard a story about some old goat went around the desert that God appeared to and said, quit worshiping what you're worshiping, come know me. And later that man had a son when he was about 100 years old, and that son was supposed to be offered uh, as a sacrifice of faith by him. And right when that old man got ready to kill his son, some other old goat, a ram, was caught in some thicket and was delivered. That sounds crazy. And from that guy and that son, all the nations of the world were supposed to be blessed. That sounds crazy. It sounds crazy that uh, even before that guy, there was another guy that was living on the earth and the earth was becoming very wicked and God chose him to build an ark in the middle of a desert before a flood came and judged the whole world and that the whole world would eventually be destroyed and yet God would use that guy who proclaimed the coming judgment of God if people trusted in him they would move towards that instrument of wood which he built that when the judgment came, they'd be raised up in and saved in. Sounds crazy. A little bit later, there's a story about a young guy that God chose when he was out there in the desert tending a flock of sheep, and he said, I'm gonna make you king over my people. I'm gonna make you considered great. I'm gonna use you to defeat a giant, a guy that's nine foot plus tall and intimidated entire armies, and I'm going to use you to take them down, and I'm going to use you to remind my people how great I am. That story sounds crazy. That's what I don't like about the Bible. It's full of crazy stories. I mean, like, think about this. What if I told you this story, that there was um, the most powerful nation in the history of the world? I mean, economically, uh, militarily-wise, it was just thriving, it was prospering, it was kicking it like no other nation ever had. And 18 men were gonna come attack this nation and just cripple it economically. They were gonna penetrate its fortress of military strength. It was gonna shut down all commerce. And these 18 men were gonna take down this, this huge national force of economic power and military strength. If I told you that 18 guys did that, you'd go, that's what I don't like about your Bible, Todd. That's a ridiculous story. And yet, if you were tuning in September 11, 2001, that's exactly what happened. That in history, 18 men shut this country down. They melted the symbols of economic strength and power, the World Trade Center. They penetrated uh, the fortress, which represents our worldwide military strength, and our nation was paralyzed and in fear. That's just 15 years ago in history. And it flat sounds crazy if you tell it a certain way looking back. The Bible's filled with crazy stories. I'm gonna tell you one of the craziest ones tonight. I'm gonna tell you that there's some lesson in there for you. I'm gonna introduce it to you by just giving you a riddle. This is a riddle that some guy that apparently had more money than sense uh, had put word out that if anybody could come up with a puzzle or a riddle that they themselves had created that he couldn't answer, he would give them $1,000. This was decades ago, and that was a lot of money. And so some woman entered this particular riddle into the contest, and the guy couldn't solve it. I want to see if you can solve it, and we'll give you a prize. What are we going to give him, David? Entrance to launch. <laughs> we're going to do that? No, we're not. But we're going to give you the riddle anyway. All right? Here's the riddle. Adam, God made out of dust, but he thought best to make me first. So I was made before man to answer God's most holy plan. A living being I became, and Adam gave to me my name. I from his presence withdrew, and more from Adam never knew. I did my maker's law obey, nor ever from it went astray. Thousands of miles I go each year, but seldom on earth do I appear. For purpose-wise, which God did see, he put a living soul in me. A soul from God I did claim, and God from me took the soul again. So when from me the soul had fled, I was the same as when first made, and without hands, feet, or soul, 
I travel on from pole to pole. I labor hard by day by night. To fallen men I give great light. Thousands of people, young and old, will by my death great light behold. No right or wrong can I conceive the scripture I cannot believe. Although my name is there and found, they are to me an empty sound. No fate of death doth trouble me. Real happiness I'll never see. To heaven I will never go, nor will I go to hell below. Now when these lines you slowly read, go search your Bible with all speed. For that my name is written there, I do honestly to you declare. Now that, my friends, is brilliant. Especially when you know the answer. Anybody who's never heard that before have any idea? Maybe somebody who didn't know what we were talking about tonight have any idea what the answer to that could be? What do you got out there? So wisdom? Holy Spirit? No, no, and no. The answer is a whale. Now listen again. Adam, God made out of dust, but he thought best to make me first. If you know anything about Genesis, the order of creation, the animals, the sea creatures were made first. So I was made before man to answer God's most holy plan. A living being I became, and Adam gave to me his name. You guys know, Adam named all the animals. I from his presence withdrew, from Adam's presence withdrew, and more from Adam never knew. Adam never taught me anything again. I did my maker's law obey, nor ever from it went astray. Thousands of miles I go each year, but seldom on earth do I appear. For purpose wise, which God did see, he put a living soul in me. Now we're getting to the story. Yeah. Yeah, you see why it was safe to offer you guys not just the launch this year, but a new car and a million dollars. Sorry no one got it. But listen to this, this is really great. A soul from me God did claim and took from me that soul again. So when from me the soul had fled, I was made the same as when first made. And without hands, now feet or soul, I travel on from pole to pole. I labor hard by day by night to fallen men, I give great light. Now that one might be kind of hard. Why? Did you know that what they would use to make light is they would burn Blubber, whale oil, yeah, exactly. Thousands of people, young and old, will by my death great light behold. No right or wrong can I conceive. The scripture I cannot believe. Although my name therein is found, they are to me an empty sound. No fate of death to trouble me, real happiness I'll never see. To heaven I will never go, nor will I go to hell below. Animals don't have a soul, don't have that kind of judgment. They're here and gone, not like you. Pay attention tonight. Now when these lines you slowly read, go search your Bible with all speed. For that my name is written there, I do honestly to you declare. We're talking about a whale. No, we're not. We're talking about the story of Jonah and the answer to the riddle the whale. But here's a riddle for you. Why does God care so much, or does God care so much about you? Especially if you coming in here tonight know just how wrong you are in the way you live. You, unlike the whale who does whatever God tells him to do, don't do at all what God tells you to do, and you well know it. And you are somebody that is very far from God. And the question is, does God care about you? And I'm going to show you the answer to that tonight. And I'm also going to show you the answer to this. Let's say by some miraculous story of grace, you have come to know already that God loves you and cares for you. Are you fully engaged in the way that God wants you to be engaged with the truth that you have come to know? So we're going to read the story of Jonah and the whale. It's a crazy story. But what you're going to find out is this isn't really a story that is to be discussed about whether it is allegorical or whether it's a parable. An allegory is a story that everything means anything and that there's lots of different meanings to it. A parable is that there is some meaning to the story but not what's there right immediately on the surface of it or is it historical? To understand what the genre is, genre as you guys know because you're educated, is just a way to talk about what kind of literature something is. Is it poetical? Is it allegorical? Is it historical narrative? What genre is Jonah? Should we believe it as a story that is really true? It's not really a question of literature. It's a question of who you think Jesus is because Jesus, I will tell you at the very end of our time tonight, compares his life and the final miracle authenticating who he was to this story. And if you believe Jesus is who he says he was, if you believe there is a B.C. and an A.D., if you believe there's a year of our Lord where everything pivots, all of human history pivots, then you better believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said that there was a Noah. Do you know that Jesus talked about Noah 
And so it's not whether the story of Noah could possibly happen, it's whether Jesus could possibly be who he claimed to be. Do you know that it's not crazy to think that all of humanity came from an Adam and an Eve, two people created in the image of God? It's really a question of do you believe Jesus is who he said he is because Jesus said God created an Adam and an Eve. It's not really a question of whether or not an old man in the desert wandering around could actually have implications under your life because Jesus said that this old man Abraham has implications on your life. It's not really a question of whether David existed and slayed a giant because Jesus believed that David existed. So all these stories that we talk about in this before Christ, we don't have to really wonder too much about. We've got to answer just one question. Who is Jesus? What was he doing on the cross? And when he came off that cross, was he dead? And if he was dead, how in the world did he live again? Because if it's true that Christ is God and he died for me and that he predicted his own death and his own means of defeating death as a sign that he was a man who did not owe any obligation to sin's wages, which is death, then you better pay attention to him. For me, I decide the story of Jonah and the whale is true because I don't make it a habit of arguing with guys who walk on water, calm the wind and the waves, give blind sight, and are risen from the grave. I happen to go, those guys might know something I don't. And so what I wanna really talk with you tonight about is this story, and I'm gonna take it for what Jesus says it was, which is as a historical revelation anticipating an even greater resurrection. So here's one question we might ask ourselves. Is it possible that a whale could swallow a human being? Now, I'm no expert in marine biology, but I have done some research. Uh, My buddy and I, when we every now and then take our wives away for vacation, we go down sometimes to Mexico. When we go to Mexico, we Um, are in Cabo oftentimes when whales are down there. We've just made a habit of grabbing snorkels and uh, fins, and when we see a whale coming down the shore, we just hook it out there in the ocean. Now, about five years ago, we got out, and we thought we could get near a whale, and we got out there near this humpback, and here's a picture of my buddy and I out in the ocean with a whale. Now, what's wild, no, not that one, the one before that, you can clearly see the whale, What's, nope, nope, the original one where there's two heads and a big whale right next to us. That's the one we want to show first as we talk. You'll see it in just a moment. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, in that particular picture where there's two of us with this whale that is there, maybe the, maybe the picture didn't make it to you, we actually didn't see the whale this particular time. It surfaced about 15 feet from us and this giant in the ocean that was near us, we completely missed It was just that quiet. No, that's not the one. Don't even try. We'll get to those in a minute. (laughs) Appreciate you trying, though. All right? So anyhow, uh, that whale that was out there, we missed. Now, a couple years later, we get back out. Now, let me just show you this about whales. This is how big whales are. Here's a slide with all different kinds of whales. All right? And you can see that they're anywhere from 69 to 90 feet if you're dealing with a blue whale, or a humpback, which is the whale I swim out there sometimes to see, because that's what are out there, are 42 to 50 feet. Just to give you an idea, okay? A school bus is about 37 feet long. So here's a school bus you know, behind me, okay? These whales are anywhere from the middle of that iMag here in Dallas to the middle of that iMag in Dallas. Here's a picture of a diver. This is a true story. There was a whale that was caught off the coast of Uh, California not long ago from a uh, um, a bunch of crab nets. It was weighted down. It couldn't get up to breathe. And a a fisherman saw it and it radioed into a bunch of environmentalists and they went out and they realized the only way they're going to save this whale is to cut it free. And so they took a bunch of knives and they cut the, the netting off this whale. And when the whale was freed up, it swam around them with circles of joy. The one guy said when he was cutting that last bit of netting off its mouth, he said that eye of that whale just watched him. Every movie made. And then it went, and just when it was cut free completely, swam circles of joy, and it said it went up to every single diver and nudged it. Here's one last picture. I know, I know. So here's one last picture that was taken of one diver with that particular humpback whale. Now that is an amazing picture. What I want you to see is the size of that human next to that humpback whale giving a big humpback one to the, you know, the guy. And, uh, and so that mouth on that humpback whale though goes almost all the way down to where its dorsal fin is. Now a couple years later, when I was with my buddy and we swam out, we saw this humpback whale and we did get close. Here's the pictures that my fault, I didn't get these squared away earlier, but this is me and my buddy out in the ocean. My wife was on the shore with a 
camera and she was taking pictures. There we are and we see a whale coming. You'll start to see it now in the second picture move a little bit closer towards us and you can see the ripples. That whale started to dive so we dove and this was the picture she had when there was nothing there. She told me, look, if you guys get swallowed, I'm going to get a massage before I haul your little butts back to the States. But anyway, when that thing came up and was gone, I actually had a chance with this whale as it came by. I waited for that dorsal fin to go by me and just got close enough where I, I saw the size of that mouth. The mouth itself, if that whale was 60 feet long, was 25 feet long. There's no question that thing could have swallowed me up. Now, here's the question. If a whale swallowed a man whole, by the way, they found a whale not many years ago that had swallowed a 450-pound giant squid whole. 450 pounds. And it was later, you know, uh, killed, that particular whale, and they, it was not yet digested. And they were just amazed at the ability of these animals that typically eat krill and just run it through its, um, its system and, and process it that way, had swallowed something like a giant squid. All that to say, I've seen a whale up close. Let me just tell you, it can swallow you. But here's the deal. Could you live if you were in the belly of a whale three days like Jonah was? I'm gonna make a case that Jonah didn't need to live for three days in the belly of a whale. I'm gonna make a case that it wouldn't surprise me at all if he died. And God raised him from the dead three days later when he was regurgitated by that whale. I don't really need to figure it out. I guess if God wanted him to be in that first little stomach and scientists will tell you that, that different amounts of food are moved in different directions, that Jonah, for whatever reason, was not processed by that whale and was three days in the deep, Jesus said, not just Jonah in the story that's in the Old Testament, but Jesus said, I'm gonna give you a sign, it's gonna be the sign of Jonah, that a man will be three days in the deep, in the dark, and will raise again to proclaim to you amazing news. Now here's something else that's kind of crazy, is that the people at Jonah was told to go and share the story of, uh, of repentance with, that there was a God that does exist in the heavens that people are gonna have to do business with. He was called to go to the Ninevites. The Ninevites were the most awful people on the face of the earth. They were the enemies of the nation of Israel. And Jonah knew that God was merciful and he wanted nothing to do with that message going to those Assyrians. Assyrians were notoriously evil. They were, fa in fact, the very first well-known terrorists. They didn't just seek to conquer lands. They sought to conquer lands by terror. They would run poles through their enemies, up through their backside, through their gill, if you will, through their jaw, and they would use them to light their way. They would take the skins of their enemies and they would use them to, to provide further rain, if you will, resistance to their tents. They would cut the heads off their enemies and they would stack them up like cannonballs in pyramids. And they wouldn't just defeat you, they would terrorize you. And they were hated by all nations, feared by all nations, and Jonah, when he heard word that God wanted him to go and proclaim the message of forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation to him, Jonah said, I'm not going there. Whether he was scared to go there or whether he just didn't want those enemies to experience grace doesn't matter he decided to go the opposite direction. Let's read the story of Jonah, and I think you're gonna find some application that will encourage you tonight. Jonah chapter one says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. I just wanna stop and make a couple of quick observations here because in every little bit of scripture, there's, there's something there for you because a lot of people kinda of go, well, man, I'm not like Jonah. This doesn't really apply to me. And I wanna let you know this, that, that there is a responsibility for anybody that the word of the Lord has come to. And having received grace and mercy, having received from God revelation, you are necessarily given with that reception some responsibility. There's a great question that people often ask. They, hey, well, what about people that have never heard the story of Jesus Christ? The Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. And so what about the unevangelized heathen? Has anybody ever hit you up with that one? What about those that have never heard? Is there any way that they can be saved? And sometimes people ask that question because they're trying to figure out, hey, if there's a loophole for that guy, maybe there's a loophole for me. And, and by the way, even if there's no loophole for that guy, I think God's unjust if he's gonna judge people who are condemned because they've rejected a Jesus in whom they've never heard. Now, there was a guy that was a great communicator who lived about 150, 160 years ago. 
His name was Spurgeon. And Spurgeon was asked the question, what about the unevangelized heathen? Can they be saved? And Spurgeon's response, I thought, was brilliant. By the way, if you're not familiar with a little resource we created around here called Real Truth Real Quick, we've answered that question. So in five minutes, you can just Google unevangelized heathen, Real Truth Real Quick, or, uh, or Todd Wagner, unevangelized heathen. <laughs> Those two things sometimes go together. <laughs> and, and, and you'll get a little five-minute response on a biblical perspective on that answer. But let me give you this answer tonight. Because I thought it was brilliant what Spurgeon said when he was asked that question. Spurgeon said, to me, it's a much greater question. Can those of us who have heard the gospel and refuse to share it with those who have not heard it really be saved? Let me say that again. You know, sometimes when people ask you that question, what they're really looking for is a loophole themselves, like, hey, maybe uh, if that guy gets off, I can get off. And let me just tell you, the person who's asking that question, whatever is true, the unevangelized heathen isn't true of them or they wouldn't be asking the question. But I'll just give you a little insight real quick. The Bible never says that there's anybody anywhere that will be judged because they've rejected a Jesus who's never heard. The Bible also says that God is just. And the Bible does still say that that person who's never heard of Jesus is under judgment because of their own conscience they violate and because of the truth they suppress in righteousness revealed by God in all of creation. But I will tell you this, if you really care about the non-evangelism, the, the greatest thing that you can do is respond to the message of grace yourself and then start to do something about getting the message to them. Here's what Jonah chapter one, verse one says. Jonah chapter one, verse one says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. As soon as the word of the Lord came to Jonah, he was a prophet. And when this happens, you have great responsibility. And it doesn't really matter whether or not you like the people that the message is supposed to go to. God calls you to love them. In fact, he calls you to suffer for them that they may know. And in fact, the more you suffer to take the message to them, the more it's a sign for them about how much God loves them. This is what was said of uh, Paul when he was talking to the people that were in a certain town at that day called Ephesus. And he just said to them, he said, hey man, listen, don't you lose heart when you hear about my tribulations for they are your glory. In other words, when you see how much God wants me to suffer just so you can get the message of redemption, don't you worry about that. In fact, it ought to be a constant reminder of how much God loves you. The Bible tells us when, when we look at how much God loves us that he would take his only begotten son who is eternally dwelt in glory with the rest of the Godhead and he would not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself. In other words, he didn't stop being God but he stopped holding on to his ability to act in a way that his divine eternal perfection demands and deserves and he humbled himself and he found himself in the appearance of a man and being made in the image of a man he became obedient even to the point of death why because God is a just God he in fact will judge sin but he's a loving God and so he wants to justify those who deserve judgment and so God solves this problem by letting himself in the person of his son which is the visible image of the invisible God go through unspeakable horrors for you. And when we see what Christ went through, it's two things. It makes you wonder what kind of love is this? And it makes you wonder how valuable are those people that God gave his son for? When you look at who the Ninevites were in history and you see what God's going to do with his prophet. Now Jonah was not just any prophet. Jonah was already kicking it. He had already been faithful as a prophet to Israel. His name is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14 as the guy who had done his job. And God took this effective, faithful prophet and he said, hey, guess what? I don't just love folks who speak Hebrew. I love those folks over there that are worshiping, guess what? Dagon. Who is Dagon? He is the fish god. And so even in Jonah's rebellion, you're gonna watch how God works Jonah's rebellion for good as a way to either further confirm his message to the Assyrians. Now, God didn't want Jonah to rebel, but God's gonna work all things for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Jonah just happened to go through a little bit more heartache because he didn't obey God outright. When the word of the Lord comes to you, you are a prophet. And I don't really wanna hear anything about how you don't think you're gifted, how you don't think that you're 
capable, if the word of the Lord comes to you, you are his prophet. And if you have profited from the word of God, you carry with that prophet a necessary obligation to help others. The reason that you are blessed is to be a blessing. Not so you can scoff at those who do not have what you have. And by the way, you know that if you're blessed, it means you've received something you don't deserve. And so the last thing you want to do is look at arrogance with others who didn't receive what you have received. The word grace in Greek is the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. It's where we get the English word charity, which means you receive something that you don't earn or deserve. And so when you look at other people who don't have what you have, the last thing you should do is go, well, how come you don't have what I have when you have what you have? Because it was a gift. All we are is individuals who as beggars have received bread that we didn't earn to deserve. And what any beggar who has received something they don't deserve should do is to tell other people who are hungry where they can receive it. I don't ever get discouraged when I come up against people who don't know the kindness of God and the goodness of who he is because frankly, I'm not really sure how in my arrogance and in my self-sufficiency and in my general prosperity and blessed way have come to a point in my life where I really understood my need for God. Other than this, the kindness of God let me see that there's lots of ways that seem right to me but they're always gonna end in the way of death. I love the story of a guy that was a Supreme Court justice um, in England, and he was a very righteous man, a very philanthropic man. He, he was kind and gracious to many. He was just as a judge, and he was a leader and a ruler in his church. He was an elder, if you will. And he was one time at the communion rail, and, and next to him, a, a guy that he had prosecuted and that he had um, actually uh, adjudicated over and had sent to prison took communion next to him. Now, this particular distinguished judge was good friends with the um, the rector of that particular Episcopal church or Anglican church, and they were walking home after that particular Sunday, and the rector said to this distinguished judge, hey, did you see who took communion next to you today? And the judge said, yes, I did. And the rector said, what an amazing picture of grace. And the judge said, I absolutely agree, but let me ask you a question. Of whom do you speak? And the rector said, well, I'm talking about the guy that was in jail, of course. And he goes, no, you shouldn't be saying it was an amazing work of grace that that guy came to Christ. The amazing work of grace is that I came to Christ. I was born into a loving home. I was raised and educated. I've been prosperous in my industry my entire day. I'm a respected citizen of this community. And that God would allow me to see my desperation and need before him. That's a work of grace. That man has been a scourge from his birth, abandoned by his father, Havoc on society, in prison for his wrong, suffered greatly for his rebellion. That man has every reason to see his need for salvation. The work of grace is in one as righteous and as acceptable in society's eyes as me, that I know that I desperately need a savior. Look, some of you guys are out there and you think you don't have some spectacular testimony that, that, that there's not been some journey through the great abyss you don't have three abortions and you haven't come through 16 different bits of gender dysphoria and clicked on every possible gender description on Facebook before you found Jesus. So you don't have a real testimony. Let me tell you something, man. You've got a testimony. If you've lived in this life and have largely lived a moral and good life, maybe you've been raised in a godly home and you've come to see that the reason you're rightly related to God is not because your parents took you to church or early on you were uh, described about the goodness of God, but that you in your life personally responded to that at some point. And you saw how great a need you had for a savior. There is no one under heaven who doesn't need to repent. And when you look at others that maybe struggle in ways that are different than you, and you look on them with arrogance, you don't understand how great the salvation is that has saved you. Jonah's problem, you'll see, is that he thought that he was a prophet, so God was lucky to have him. And what you're going to see is this prophet needed to be saved as much as those that he was called to go preach to. Jonah was given the word of the Lord, and if you've been given the word of the Lord, you are a prophet. He is told to arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Just know this that there is no sin under heaven which God does not see. And sometimes we, we look at what's going on out there in the world and we see all this evil and we wonder when God's gonna act against it. Mark my word, it'll come soon enough. 
you need to know that God's always cared about sin everywhere. And it says in the Bible, in Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel 18, and other places, that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. Let me say that again. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And so neither should we. But God has appointed a time when he will judge all the world, but, but that time, sometimes he delays. The scripture says the reason he's delayed it, at least until June 14, 2016, is not because he's slow as some count slowness, but God is patient towards you, wishing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God doesn't take delight in your wicked death. And so I don't know how long God's gonna tarry. I wanna make this point right here. Listen, this is true, Ninevites, that God always offers forgiveness to your repentance, and you need to know that. But you also need to know that God does not promise tomorrow to your procrastination. Today is the day, the scripture says, that you should respond to the grace of God that's made known to you. Because surely in a flood of great waters he may not be found. And so none of us know when time's gonna be rolled up like a scroll or when our day is gonna come quickly upon us, but it's gonna come. And, and, and God knew when it was gonna come for the Ninevites. It was 612 BC. Jonah appears somewhere in the eighth century BC, about 150 years before Nineveh was judged, he sent them Jonah. Now what you're gonna find out in this story is the Ninevites responded to Jonah's preaching. But what also happened is a couple of generations later they reverted back to the worship of their pagan gods. And so God sent them another prophet. You know that God sent two prophets, not just one to Nineveh, the second one is called Nahum. The word means comfort. Jonah means peace, that God sent a dove. It means dove, actually, and, and dove is, is one that came in peace. And he, he, he came to them and said, listen, I, I don't want to be at enmity between you and you wicked Assyrians, but you've got to know this, that I'm a God that isn't just a God willing to make peace with you. I'm a God that if you don't make peace with me, you're going to have to do business with me. And you might think of me letting you run in your riotous reign over me while you're in your 20s or, or in, your, in your excessive celebration of youth, that judgment will never come. But mark my word, judgment is coming. And so God kept sending people who had heard the word of the Lord to them. And their wickedness was not in any way missed by God. This is what it says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. It says, can a man hide himself? in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Psalm 139 says this, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. There is no way I can go from the presence of God. You're gonna find out that that's not just true of Assyrians who haven't repented yet. That's true of believers who are not responding yet. So God was well aware of the Assyrians' wickedness. And he was about to send a prophet to them. It says, but with Jonah, in verse three, rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Jaffa. Jaffa's a port city. And it says he found a ship which was going to Tarshish, which is in Gibraltar, which is in the southern part of Spain, which is about 2,500 miles the wrong direction from Nineveh. Here's a map of it, okay? So, so Jaffa, it's a, it's a modern day town today. You can go to Jaffa. I've been there at the port of Jaffa and you look across the Mediterranean Sea and you gotta sail across the Aegean Sea and make your way all the way underneath Italy and further make your way all the way over to where the rock of Gibraltar is there in southern Spain. It was the farthest known part of the sea that anybody sailed to. And so Jonah said, let me get the fat out of anything that God has me doing because what God has me doing didn't make any sense to Jonah. Watch what happens when Jonah, the prophet, decides to not walk in the light that he has been given. It says, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. 
And the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and falling asleep. One of the things you're gonna see if you study this is, is just the way the writer talks about how Jonah keeps going down. He went down to Jaffa. He wanted to go down to Tarshish. There's trouble, so he goes down to the bottom and the bowels of the ship. He tried to go asleep. He tried to numb himself from the horrors that were around him as he knew he was trying to run away from the will of God, but you can't do that. The captain approached him and said, how is it you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. In other words, we don't know who you believe in, but we're all calling on every God that we know. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish because our gods aren't listening. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said, tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Well, if only that was true. The men became extremely frightened. They said to him, how could you do this? Because Jonah apparently had gone on to explain to them that I know what's going on. I, I, God's told me to go right and I'm going left. It says the men became extremely frightened. They said, how could you do this? For they knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Can I just make a real simple observation here? Because, man, you guys need to know this. Whenever you run into somebody that is fleeing from the presence of the Lord, it's going to be trouble. This is why, and I want to say this as kindly as I can to you, this is why, you know, God says, look, man, if you want to marry, you have not sinned. It's fine. Go ahead and get married. But I'm going to beg of you, if you get married, don't yoke yourself. Don't enter into business with somebody whose business is fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Don't date somebody, and this is, this is the big thing about sex in relationships, okay? The problem with sex in relationships is that when you're having premarital sex, it, it's not just the problems that premarital sex can create in your relationship, and it can create some because you're using a gift that God gave you in a way that he didn't decide that it, or declare it should be given to you. God doesn't have any problem with sex. He designed sex. God's a huge fan of sex. But he's just saying, look, man, this gift I've given you, use that gift the way that it's intended to be used, right? The most classic illustration of, of a gift. I mean, there's no greater gift that God has given man than fire. It brings light, it brings heat, it brings warmth. I, 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 I love fire. I have three fireplaces in my house in Dallas where the average temperature is, you know, almost 60 degrees. Every chance I get, I build a fire in my home. But here's the deal, man. This thing, whenever you build a fire, our, our family gathers around it. it. It it brings light, it brings warmth. I love the smell. It, it just attracts people. But if we took fire out of the place it is designed to be in our home and we just moved it to the to the couch, because we love fire, so we're gonna take it everywhere, we just put it in the cabinet. Or go, hey, let's just put fire over here on the wall. It, it's, it's a great thing, but when you take that gift and you put it in the wrong spot, it no longer is something that brings uh, a joy and warmth to the home. It destroys the home. And sex is just like that. And, and here's the thing. There, there's consequences when, when we take a gift and we misuse it. And God's not angry at you. You're not being punished for, for the way you misuse the gift. That that's why you get an STD or that's why you get an unwanted pregnancy. I mean, that's just what happens. It's, it's like sin is its own judgment. It's not God smiting you. It's just what happens when you use gifts wrong. It's like if I gave you a chainsaw and you go, hey, look, a chainsaw Todd gave me to cut firewood and to take down trees that are going to fall on my roof. And you go, you know what? Let's use it as dental floss. It, it'll do a fine job. Okay, that chainsaw is dental floss for you. But it's not going to also probably do well for the rest of your face. It'll get that little annoying piece of popcorn which out between your teeth, which isn't it crazy that when you finally get that piece of popcorn out between your teeth, what's the first thing you do? You chew it, right? <laughs> Don't we? We're like, God dang. Hmm, got it. <laughs> isn't that like us in sin? This is really bothering me. This is really bothering me. Okay, good. The pain's gone. Let me go back to that sin. It's crazy. Spit it out. 
So look, when you use a gift and you misuse the gift, it's not like I'm judging you because you misuse the gift. The misusing of the gift is the judgment. I'm not mad at you. I don't have to be mad at you. Just misusing the chainsaw is its own judgment. There might be a moment where it pops out and it feels good, but boy, it's not gonna last long. And all I wanna tell you is this. This is why God tells you, hey, listen, I'm begging you to not sail with people who are running from the presence of the Lord. You yoke yourself to that. There might be a time because people and relationships are a gift for me that that relationship initially will be a glory to you. That that chainsaw will work to get that little annoyance, but it's gonna keep moving through and it's gonna hit the nerve and it's gonna cause all kinds of pain and create scars and death. And so God just says, look, man, you're free to marry, but I'm just begging you, don't marry. Don't yoke with somebody who flees from the presence of the Lord. This is the biggest problem with premarital sex. Are you ready? It's an indication that no matter what somebody tells you about how serious they are about wanting what God wants, what they really want is what they want, and they don't really care what God wants. They're gonna rationalize and justify whatever they want to because it gives them pleasure And when you yoke yourself to somebody that drags you into a relationship, and no matter what they say about God, I don't care if you met them at the porch, I don't care if they're a community group leader, if they drag you into using a provision of God and and sail in their relational um, practices with you away from the presence of the Lord, and you yoke yourself to them, what you are doing is you're saying right now, I want to sail with somebody who's already declared, it doesn't matter what God says, they're going to rationalize and justify their own program. And I'm just going to tell you, That's going to be your problem, not the fact that you had premarital sex, but that you're yoking yourself to somebody who sails through this life in a way that has no respect for the navigational charts that God who loves you has given you. It is a tell. It's an indication that they are their own sovereign. And that makes for really rocky seas. So what you're gonna find out is that God's not mad at you when trouble comes in your life. He's just letting you experience a little bit of the the problems that, that, that come when you move away from him. And that's what a loving God does. I'll show you that in just a moment with Jonah. They said to him, what would you, we do that, that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Jonah's telling you, this is what you have to do. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Now, this is where Jonah, who is a type of Christ, he's a, a picture of who Christ is going to be, is a picture, but not the complete picture. Watch this. Here's what he says. What you've got to do is pick me up and throw me into the sea. The only way that this judgment is going to leave you is if I become a sacrifice for you. This next line, I know on account of me this great storm has come upon you is not what's true of Christ. Christ says it's on account of you that this great storm is gonna come upon me. All of you like sheep have gone astray and the Lord will cause the iniquity of you to fall on me. Jesus says, I'm going to go a place you cannot go to stand before the judgment of God. I'm gonna give my life, but because I'm without sin, once I give my life for sin and the debt's been paid, God can in his just pour out his wrath and in his justice declare that the debt has been paid so that I myself can be the first fruits of those raised from the dead and all who believe in me and follow the words of this great prophet can be saved. But watch what men do. Sometimes the way of God doesn't make sense. It never makes sense to pagans who don't believe in prophets. The pagans here go, look, that doesn't sound like what God would want me to do. And so what do they do? It says, the men rode desperately to return to land. See, this is what men do. Men don't believe that the prophet has to be given for them. Men believe that their own efforts can get them back to a place of safety. And so they worked with all their might to make their way back to peace and safety, just like most men and women today. When you ask them, hey, are you in a place in your life where you think the seas of wrath between you and God can be brought to a place where they're calm. You go, yeah, well, how? Well, I think I just gotta behave as I sail through life. And if I behave more than I disbehave, the seas will eventually be calm and I'll make my way into the presence of God. And God says, no, man, you gotta do something. And that is to believe that the prophet has been thrown into the sea of judgment for you. And that's the only way that you can be reconciled to me. Men always try and row their way to God. They always try and work their way 
But watch, watch what happens when men try and earn their salvation. It says the storm is becoming even worse against them. They could not make it for the sea was becoming even stormier. And then they called on the Lord finally and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, don't let us perish on account of this man's life. Don't let us put, do not put innocent blood on us for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah. Finally, they listened to the word of the Lord because why? Because the pain got so great that they finally realized that the efforts of their own way to navigate through the sea of life were futile. You're gonna see this theme show up in, in pagans and in disobedient prophets. And there's a little truth that I want you both to understand, and, and I'm going to say it to you in a couple of different ways. And then number one, I'm just going to tell you, when, when you are doing things that God doesn't want you to do, and, and consequence comes to you, it's not because God's trying to pay you back for the wrong that you have done. It's God is trying to bring you back to what you should do. Let me say that again. Is when you experiencing wrong is the wages of the wrong that you have done. It's not God's punishment. It's God's allowing you to experience the consequences of your choices so that you can learn to hate those choices, not because God's trying to pay you back for your choices, but because he's trying to bring you back to him. And what you're gonna see is that the pagans who didn't know who Jonah was and what the prophet said tried to work until that work failed them and there's a way that seemed right to them, but it was leading to death and so they finally stopped the way that seemed right to me. And they repented and listened to the prophet. You're gonna find that the prophet tried to go where he wanted to go and do what he wanted to do until it got him further and further and further in trouble. And finally, he says, I think I'll start to do what God wants me to do. Can I just tell you something? God's not angry at you. God is not trying to catch you in your sin. He is looking to free you from the sin which has captured you. And one of the grandest things that God can do for you is to let you reap what you sow. And so the God of life and light and joy, when you leave him, lets you experience darkness and despair and death. Not as a judgment, because sin is its own judgment. Are you here? And are you at a place in your life where you're like, you know what, this, this way which seems right to me is not bringing me what I want. I mean, I mean, I might have momentary fits of pleasure. I might have that little kernel pop out of my mouth for a second, but I'm, there's, there's a long scar there afterwards. There's a bitter aftertaste of me using the gifts God's given me in a way that he doesn't intend. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And God goes, okay, well, come here, man. Let me, let me heal you. Let me put you on a different course. I'm not mad at you. But I'm also not gonna protect you from the consequences. Because that's what a loving father does. He doesn't enable you. And he doesn't move towards you in anger. Now, God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? He hates sin because he loves you. And so what God do as a result of your sin? He did something about it. He let himself be cast into the sea of judgment. And just like Jonah, Jesus would say to you, hey, look, man, here's the only way you're gonna be saved. Not by your rowing and trying to be righteous before God, but you gotta let me be thrown in, man. You gotta let me be thrown before the judgment of God. That's the only way that this sea is gonna get calm. And you go, that doesn't seem right to me that this guy would die that I might live, but it's really not about you because you're not an infinite, holy, perfect God, so you don't know what kind of infinite, holy, perfect sacrifice he demands. And so you can row all you want to try and make yourself righteous. And I'm just gonna tell you, the sea's only gonna get more violent. You're never gonna rest. You're never gonna know if you're righteous enough. And if you would just listen, the answer would be you'll never be righteous enough to meet the standard of God. If a man, it says, commits one sin, he is guilty of the law. He's a lawbreaker. The standard of scripture is be perfect as I'm perfect. If your righteousness doesn't surpass that of the Pharisees, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's all of us, all of us have sinned and gone astray and all of us need a savior. You better find out who your prophet is to throw into the sea of judgment. Jesus says, I'm the guy. And they called in the name of the Lord in verse 14. They said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, don't let us perish in account of this man's life and don't let us put innocent blood in us for you, O Lord, have done as you please. So they picked up Jonah, they threw him to the sea and the sea stopped, it's raging. The men feared 
the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. It's always better to make vows after salvation and not say, Lord, I'll do this so you'll save me. Righteous men don't say, God, I'll do this so you'll save me. Righteous men see what God has done to save them and they respond to it. In other words, we as believers, we don't do what we do so God will love us. I don't say, God, I'm gonna serve you. I'm gonna be faithful to share with the Syrians. I'm gonna live my life. I'm gonna stop premarital nonsense. When I'm married, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to not look at that crap again. I'm not going to give myself over to numbing myself with drugs or other pleasures. And then God, I'll be holy. No, men see that God makes them holy and they respond. We are not people who have performance-based acceptance. We are people who understand what God has done for us. We see it. We see the peace that we have with God through the sacrifice of his holy prophet. And we go, I want to respond to that. Do you see that? There's nothing in me that will make me ever go, God, you owe me salvation. It was a gift from the beginning. I don't know why. He allowed his prophet to go into the sea of judgment for me, but having seen it, I just go, man, why wouldn't I want to serve that God? Shane did a great job earlier tonight here in Dallas, if you were here, singing and talking about the one who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. Won't he then do every good thing for us, it says in Romans 8? Why wouldn't I serve that God? And so these men saw when God had made provision for them through the sacrifice of another, they go, let's serve the God of that prophet. It is acceptance-based performance. It is love which constrains us. It's always good to make vows when you see love, not to make vows to earn love. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. He kind of go, it keeps getting worse for Jonah. He keeps going down, 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 down. But finally, in his pain, and maybe some of you guys are here tonight, and you've gone down low enough that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. It says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. God loves you enough to bring you to distress with your disobedience. God isn't looking to catch you in your sin. He is looking to free you from the sin that has captured you. God's not looking to pay you back, God's looking to bring you back. And as soon as you cry out in your distress to the Lord, he will answer. He says, I cried for help from the depths of Sheol and you heard my voice. Jonah went on from there, the story says, to do what he should do because he understood, and if you, you, you read a little bit further in chapter three, uh, verse one, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And this time Jonah got busy doing what he should do. And I just want to make a couple of quick observations now and we're done. There's really four people in life. There's folks that are lost and they acknowledge that they're lost and they know that there's no way they can row themselves to safety. And, and to you, God says, that's great. Take this provision that I've given for you. Some of you guys are here. You've, you've never come to a place yet where you know you're forgiven, but you know you're lost. And I'm here to tell you that God has thrown the prophet into the sea of judgment for you. And God has made the way of mercy. Wherever you are that you're listening, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you, and you know that you're separated from God, then, then I'm here to tell you that God wants you to be reconciled to him. He wants to offer you this gift. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And God's just here tonight to tell you, man, just let me in. If you're lost and you know it, then, then let the way and the truth and the life come into you and receive it. And then there are those that are lost and they don't know it. And to you, I wanna tell you that, that while you're still rowing, maybe while your seas aren't rough enough, all I would say to you is, look, we're not gonna love you more if you agree with us. And I'm, I'm just gonna tell you that if you like what you got, I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing, but I'm gonna remind you, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're not gonna like what you got. Because it's just a matter of time before you get low enough that the pain's gonna be intense enough that you're gonna wonder how in the world you got here. You know, one of the things I do whenever I'm with my kids and we're out and we come up across somebody that's living on the streets and we're um, asked to help them, I, I always, I, man, tell me your name. Man, my name's Todd, I introduce myself. And I just go, tell me your story. And if you wanna hear my story, I go, yeah, man. And I have my kids right there with me. I say, well, just tell us your story. How'd you end up here? And they always say the same thing. They always go, I'll tell you how I got here, man. One bad decision at a time, and then another bad decision 
after that. And I always ask them if they want to turn around those decisions or if they just want me to give them something that would give them strength to live in their rebellion and their self-will and their despair and their wandering further. And I go, I'm not going to enable you in that, man. The Bible is really clear in 2 Thessalonians 3. It says, if a man doesn't work, let his stomach work for him. Let the pain of his circumstance go, hey, being lazy, being a sluggard, being irresponsible, being addicted, not taking opportunity to deal with my addiction and to find training and to maybe be reparented and to start to work my way out. Man, let your stomach work for him. Sometimes God is not trying to pay you back, but he's trying to draw you back. And what you don't want to do is keep enabling people. You also don't want to look at those people and think, man, what a scourge of the earth. I look at them and I just go, hey, I really understand. I was with one of those guys today. And I just told him, man, you're going to have to trust me. I don't think I'm better than you. But by the grace of God, I've encountered truth maybe earlier in my life than you're encountering, and I've started to make decisions to walk with this God, and that God wants to start to walk with you. And if you'll let me, I'll begin to walk with you. We'll get shelter, we'll get training, we'll get food, we'll get provision, and I'll let you know the God that keeps me from bringing despair to my heart in the streets. This particular friend wasn't ready yet. So we had a great conversation, and I said, bro, if you like what you got, keep doing what you're doing, but if you keep doing what you're doing, you're not gonna like what you got. Thirdly, there's people who are saved and they don't act like it. There's folks that are lost and they know it. To you, I say, come. There's folks that are lost and they don't think they're lost and they like the way they're sailing. We say, you keep sailing. And when the seas get rough enough, I hope you remember tonight's message that there's somebody who's been thrown in the sea for you to make it calm. But then there's some people that have been saved and they don't sail like it. And to you, I want to just tell you, man, when you are given the word of God, and you don't deal to it kindly, you better check to see if you even know about the love of God. Because people that really know the love of God, when they see it, they make a vow, and they go, I'm gonna respond to that love. I'm not gonna try and earn it, but I see that love, and that love compels me. And I wanna just remind you that earlier story, you know, what about those people who have never heard? Well, I'm not so concerned about that person who's never heard. A better question is, what about those who have heard and don't care to share that what we have heard with others, can we really have heard? And then there's the fourth group. It's those who have really heard the word of the Lord and they're serving. And they're out there and they're faithful. And they don't look at others like they're Ninevites and man, may the grace of God not come to them. No, they really love them. I want to tell you a story of a guy I was just with. I just got back from Turkey and um, Eurasia and that general region, and I was talking to a friend of mine that is a former Amman in Jordan. He was a particular guy that was rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing as an Amman. He said, I was ready to die for Allah. I was planning to give my life on a suicide mission for Allah because I knew that was the only way that I could earn Allah's love in this system invented by men. And the systems of men are always row your way to peace with Allah. And he said, and I saw the futility of this. And eventually, before I killed myself, I died to the idea. And he said, I became an atheist. And as soon as I I left Islam, becoming an Iman, I didn't trust anything else. But because I no longer served Allah, men started to want to kill me. Now, I had another friend who had come to understand that a prophet had been given for them. That there was a God that didn't want you to earn his love, but there was a God that loved you. Do you know in Islam, there's 99 names for Allah. They're called the 99 beautiful names for the Lord. That's what Allah means in Arabic. And not a single one of those 99 names that represent Allah have the idea of love in them. And this friend told him about a God who said he is love. And he demonstrated his love in that while we're still rowing, most of us in a disobedient direction, He died for us and he made provision for us because he's just and in no means will he let the guilty go unpunished, but he himself has given his life for them that he might be just and the justifier of those that he loves. And he heard the story and he wept and he left his atheism and he became a believer. And then he came across one of his former Islamic friends who walked up behind him with a screwdriver and drove it through his back. 
He felt the pain and he turned around. The man removed the screwdriver and shoved it in the front of his chest and pulled it out to stab him a third time. And he grabbed his hands and he took his by the head. They were smashing. He was smashing his head and the guy's weakness into the wall. And he just held on to him, screaming until somebody came and broke them up. Now, in Jordan, what they do when they see two men fighting is they arrest them both. And so these two men were arrested. They stopped his hemorrhaging and bleeding. It missed all vital organs. He had a penetration through the back to the front and from the front toward the back. And they put them in the same jail cell that evening. And while he was in that same jail cell, he looked at that man. They were both cuffed so they couldn't hurt each other. And he said, I want you to know I don't hate you. And I want you to know that if I live through this, that my family's not gonna try and strike revenge against you. The next day, they were separated. They were asked to tell their story four different times. The man who was stabbed told the same story four times. The man who did the stabbing told four different stories so they knew who was lying. And they were gonna put this gentleman who had run the screwdriver through him front and back in prison and he stood up, my friend, the former Iman, who was now a follower of the prophet who was thrown into the sea for others and he said, Judge, if you will, I wanna speak to the man who did this to me. I wanna say again to the court, I forgive you and I forgive him and I love you And I know you're doing what you think you should do in order to please the God that you know, but the God that you know is no God at all. The God you need to know is the God who gave his life for you and he gave his life for me. And if he was willing to save one such as me, he's willing for me to forgive one such as you. And that man looked at him and said, now I know that your God is the one true God because I've never seen love like that. That's what people who have come to know the kindness of God do. If you have received the word of the Lord, having received it, there is an obligation to share it. I love this little poem. It always encourages me. It goes like this. It's called My Friend. It says, my friend, I stand in judgment now and feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth, I walked with you day by day. Never did you point me the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell me the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me straight to him. Though we lived together on earth, you never told me of the second birth, and now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you, but I learn now that it's too late. You could have saved me from this fate. We walked by day, we talked by night, and yet you showed me not the light. You let me live and love and die. You knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life and laughed with you through joy and strife, and yet on coming to the end, I cannot call you now. My friend. Because you didn't want to go through the awkwardness of telling me that you believe that God threw a prophet in the sea of judgment for you because you thought it would make me think you were crazy. See, man, that's what prophets do. People who are really saved and act like they're saved are a blessing to others. They realize that they were blessed to be a blessing. Can I just close this by telling you that there's another one who was a prophet who was from Kafir Nahum, Capernaum is the town. It means the village of comfort. Just like there was a prophet, Nehum, that was sent to the Assyrians who worshiped the fish god that God had once swallowed up by a great fish that was spit out probably with some sort of lactic acid all over him. So he was bleached white. And so here comes this guy spit up on the fish, looked like a ghost, preaching reconciliation with God. They might have listened to that message. In other words, his life was radically changed and he carried a message of power. So should yours. If you're really saved, you start to become that one. When Jesus was here, he was exactly that. He said, if you don't believe my words, believe my walk. They said, well, show us some more signs. He said, there's no gonna be no more signs except the sign of Jonah. When I'm swallowed up, if you will, for three days in what looks like certain death, only to live again, from which I will pronounce to you one more time, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, I don't know what you worship, but I'm gonna tell you that when you see a God defeat your great enemy, death, and he returns and tells you, I did this for you, that's not just some story in history. It is the pivot point of your eternity. And what you do with that prophet who was thrown in the sea of judgment for you will determine where you spend it. And if you know him, you will make a vow to love him the way he gave his life for you. And part of that is having received that word, is to gladly share it with others. 
And so this story that happened before Christ anticipates Christ, and the story about Christ anticipates that you should respond to it, and you should join Christ in suffering in every way that you need to so that the world might know you die to yourself, that Christ might live in you, and his message might go forth, and his power might be seen so the Ninevites could be free. Father, I pray if there's any Ninevites in the room, folks who came in here that are, that are living lives of terror, that maybe are in rooms in Houston and Fort Worth and in Dallas and other places watching around the world tonight, that um, all they seek to do is to uh, live in rebellion against God and to bring others into the, their, their powers and into their patterns so that they can have sway over them and use them for their own pleasure. And Lord, we don't look at any of the people that are here and listen to this message like we're better than them. That's, that's what the way we would have sailed unless grace came to us, unless the great prophet convinced us that there was a better way and showed us love, that he gave his life for us, that we might be reconciled to you in goodness so that we could start to sail towards safe harbors filled with hope and with song. And so Lord, we thank you just for this story in history, the way you seek after rebels. We thank you that that story anticipates the great prophet who gave his perfect life for the Ninevites like me, that I would stop rowing towards you to try and earn my way and I would receive the gift of your sacrifice that I might live. And so Lord, help me now, having seen your great love for me to make a vow to try and respond to it. Thank you that even in my imperfection and responding to that, your, your grace is sufficient. But Lord, I wanna learn more of your ways I pray that my life would be as shockingly different as Jonah's must have been when he was regurgitated from the belly of a whale for three days, that people would see that I've come from someplace else, sent forth from you, living in righteousness, sanctified by your work of deliverance, with a mouth filled with kindness and grace, speaking of the glories and goodness of who you are, not who I am realizing that the only reason I'm a prophet is because I've received from you what I freely offer to others. I pray, Lord, for people who really know you in this room, that we would not sail on our own, but we would go where you tell us to go and live as you tell us to live in humility, faithfulness, and love. Thank you that this room is filled with such men and women. Thank you tonight that more can come if they just say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I thank you that you gave your life for me. I thank you that the sacrifice of your son calmed the seas of judgment do me. I thank you, Father, that you raised him from that sea of judgment as evidence that your wrath had been satisfied and my debt has been paid. And I pray that that power that resurrected him from the grave as a sign of your grace would live in me as I walk with you for the good of others, as I sing songs of redemption to Assyrians and prophets alike. Lord, would you help us to walk with you? Would you let us live in that grace? In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, man, if that song is the cry of your heart, then you're in a really good place. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, let me just tell you, remind you about that picture. I didn't see that thing. Put it back up there. I didn't see that thing. And what's amazing is some of you guys think you're in a good place, maybe. You don't want the Lord to take over yet. You think you just swim in the ocean. There's no monster here that can swallow me up. This is all good. And, and you don't even know what's right there next to you. And God in his kindness, one day, if you're blessed because the Lord disciplines his children and those he loves, you're gonna find yourself in the belly of a whale. And if you're not ready to respond tonight, I pray you respond then. I pray you know that God's not mad at you, that he's not putting you in the belly of a whale because he's punishing you. That's just what happens when you swim in a sea where there are monsters that lurk. And anytime you're not sailing with him, you need to know there are monsters in that ocean that can swallow you easily. And God's always ready to hear your prayer. But today's the day of salvation. Let us cry to God because in a flood of great waters, he may not always be found. But if you cry to him tonight, and you say, take over, lover of my soul, that you would throw yourself in the ocean, that I might be free. He says, just, just come. And if you have come and you know him, then would you just go faithfully? 
Would you go and tell others unashamedly and boldly? Would you live and would you suffer for them? Would you go into their Nineveh and declare, don't go and mingle with the Ninevites. You've got to be distinct and different. As one raised from the dead, clothed in righteousness, declaring to them the reason for your otherworldly appearance. With freedom, not performing so God would accept you, but out of his acceptance, responding in love. Would you come if you don't know him? Let him take over. And would you go if he's taken over with you? If you're here and you're headed to launch and you want to serve others at launch and head up to the loft and jump into our leaders meeting. And uh, if you're in other towns, there's opportunities for you to serve there. Connect with your leaders. Come. Go. Worship the king who gave himself for you. In Jesus' name, be free. Bless you.